Uh, but what actually I've got is actually positioning the candidate to do something. I, I'm saying, what if? I want to be honest, as an honest Australian, I actually believe he's going to do something through Canada. Um, so you're part of a, a local thing, but you're part of a bigger thing God's doing in the world. And we're being set up to be the solution for the next thing that God wants to do in the world, this renewal that I believe he wants to bring. So I actually think, despite all the bad news, be really encouraged. These are the moments when God does incredible things and you're part of that. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Canadian Church Leaders Podcast. The heart of the Canadian Church Leaders Network can be summarized in two statements. We love pastors and we are full of hope for the future of the church in Canada. That's it. We love pastors and we are full of hope when we think about what God's doing in our nation. And we long to see the cities of Canada flourish. And we believe that healthy churches lead to healthy cities. And healthy pastors lead to healthy churches. And so our hope is that the work we do serves you as a boost of life and encouragement for those of you who are serving in local churches and ministries across Canada. And this is an exciting and unique month for the podcast because over the next four weeks, we're going to be releasing episodes that will explore themes that emerge from a new report called the Connected Generation Report. It's a Barna research project that was commissioned by the team at World Vision. The Connected Generation study was a global study of 18 to 35-year-olds, but for the Canadian report, the team did something really interesting. The first study was done in 2019, but then they went back again two years later and asked the same questions to a sample size of just over 1,000 Canadians between that age group. And now what we have is a window into the experience and perceptions of that age group in Canada, but we can also see how the pandemic has impacted their relationship to the church, faith, and other themes like that. It's a great resource for anyone wanting to better understand and reach the next generation. Inspired by their Christian faith, World Vision works to help the most vulnerable children around the world overcome poverty and experience fullness of life. And the team at World Vision Canada also wants to impact those in need here in our nation. And they want to do it by serving the local church. And that's why they commission studies like this, because they want to serve pastors and work alongside teams in Canada to see this global vision achieved. So we're going to be highlighting elements from the Connected Generation Report, but you can access the whole report at the link in the episode notes or on ccln.ca. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be sitting down with Shayla Visser from Alpha Canada, Daniel Strickland. Today, to kick it off, we've got two guests, Mark Sayers and David Kinneman. Mark is the senior leader of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia, and he's the author of books like Facing Leviathan, Disappearing Church, Reappearing Church, Strange Days. He's one of my favorite authors, and he's the host of the podcast, This Cultural Moment and Rebuilders, and he's still posting new content almost weekly on Rebuilders. Mark is a prophetic voice and is someone who's articulating a vision of Christian leadership that is truly rooted in the way of Jesus. And David Kinneman is the president of Barna, which is a leading research and communications company that provides credible knowledge and research to those of us, like pastors, who are trying to navigate the different cultural shifts happening and affecting the church today. David Kinneman is also an author of the best selling books Faith for Exiles, Good Faith, and Unchristian. It was an amazing conversation. It was deeply personal. So let's jump in right now. Well, hey, boys, um, it is really good to be with you. Uh, Mark and David, you guys are guys I look to. If I'm watching the news at night or something or scrolling, I'm like, if I could just call one or two people to help me make sense of it, I'd call you. And, and there's so much going on, news, social media. And then, then on top of that, like as pastors, there's so many voices and it can be hard to find out what's true. And so I wanted to just start by asking a question. I don't really know how to phrase this. Um, and whoever wants to start can grab it first. But um, how do I say this? What the heck is going on? <laughs> How long did you work on that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, that was that's the summation of what do I talk about with where do I start? And I'm like, I would have to know what's going on. You guys are the people I go to to find out what's going on. So so whoever wants to just explain it all to me can start. Well, it's, it's funny because I, I don't know that I have any good answers. We'll just wait for Mark to open his mouth. But I do <laughs> I do know that all of our partners and and the pastors that we interview and talk to and you know we we hear from tens of thousands of of leaders every year through our our you know research methods which is such a privilege for me to hear from people that question of what the heck 
happened and what is happening is like at the forefront of Christian ministry and I think all leaders, like how do you future proof your organization, your church, um, you know, here in the, in the States, I, I know my, the pastor that we attend church at, you know, they're, they're 30 to 50% lower every week in terms of attendance. Um, what the hell is happening is a great question. And I think the, the simplest answer to that, or at least to start is like a lot of things that were already brewing Mm-hmm. Really, just hit, they just are absolutely um, exponentially, you know, sort of scattering across the religious landscape and our our social landscape. And um, so, you know, millennials were already very likely to attend sort of digital church to supplement their congregational activities through other digital means prior to the pandemic. But after the pandemic and during the pandemic, that's just sort of like exponentially, you know, f- fragmented. And so, all of these different ways in which people's allegiances and practices mm. and um, preferences, all, all these things sort of just have massively changed in the last 18 years. I feel like I've spent, I've been now at this company for 25 plus years uh, since 95 doing social research. I actually thought I would be a local church pastor. And um, and I feel like 25 years wasn't enough practice to try to use social research to understand what was actually happening mm. in the last 18 months because it's been a real-time experiment on religious practice and preference and, you know, what it means to lead in, in times of great change. Hmm. Okay. Before I want to throw to you, Mark, but Dave, I just want to say something. One of the things I really admire about you is as someone, and I, I've never heard you say that, maybe you thought you would do pastoral work is when I read your books, you're so much more than a researcher and your research is amazing. And the work of Barna, I just I find so helpful and so grateful for it. Um, but I really do see you as like, a pastoral voice to pastors. And you joked earlier, like, I'm not the right person to bring on to encourage people. But I don't know, when I read Faith for Exiles, when I read Good Faith, I found myself strangely encouraged because you gave me a plot line as a pastor through the noise. Um, But then also, like, I think that you've allowed God's, like, hopeful view of the future seep into your voice so much that even when you're saying, I'm going to tell you the hardest news you're going to hear, you've been telling people that the church is shrinking for like decades. And yeah. yet somehow I find myself always like encouraged and built up and pointed to Jesus. So I just appreciate that about you, man. Thanks, Jason. That means a lot. It really does. Mark, what the <laughs> heck's going on, man? <laughs> um, uh, Arundhati Roy, the Indian novelist, I think it was in April 2020 in the Financial Times, said this line, which I think is really helpful, that pandemics are portals from one world to another. And I think it's not that COVID has changed the world, but rather what we've seen is these various predicted changes coming in the world. Um, And even I think some staff, I I picked up a book off my bookshelf as I was walking out of the office yesterday by John Drain, the British writer who wrote it probably in the 90s, Faith in a Changing Culture. It's literally has not been taken off my shelf for probably you know, years apart from moving it. And I just opened it and I thought, man, all this stuff that people were even predicting in the 90s, the sort of move to almost a post-truth relativist age, technological disruption, um, almost an irrational uh, you know, world. Uh, it's all sort of you know, seemed to have accelerated in the last sort of phase. So you know, I would say we're at a, it's not just about COVID, it's actually about a series of changes that are occurring in the world. Um, and all of them are disruptive. Um, mm. So we see changes in the political sphere. The political playbook, as we understood it, for about 20 years has been upended. That began in 2016. Even Canada's, uh, you know, Westminster system is looking a little bit different, uh, uh, you know, in, in, you know, the election that's been. Um, and, uh, you know, so we see also disruptive change in the sort of social and cultural sphere where sort of traditional conventions and norms are thrown out, remixed, the definitions are changing. We see disruption in the technological sphere, uh, obviously with social media, the internet, everything from cryptocurrencies uh, to the metaverse. Um, and, you know, we've seen obviously with COVID, this sort of, you know, disruption, this ge- geopolitical disruption as we're recording this, uh, the United States and Great Britain and Australia have just announced, you know, this new sort of defence pact against um, the rising threat of China. Um, And we're seeing, you know, the things in the international supply chain. I just bought a car online for the first time in my life um, here in lockdown Melbourne, and it will not arrive a Toyota Camry, you know, uh, pretty uh, exotic road machine, Um, (laughs) but it's not going to arrive at my house for another five months because there's all this disruption in the global supply chain. 
And so uh, I think pastors where in the past they would talk about this stuff as like, oh, this is interesting theoretical discussion you might have in a conference breakout room. Now it's actually on the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is interlinked with all of that. So I think we're at this axial huge moment of change. We're living in the space in between eras. Uh, we're in a transitional moment. Hmm. Well, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the Connected Gen project and specifically because it's unique what has been able to happen with the Connected Gen research project as it relates to Canada because you're able to take some data from 2019 and then repeat with the same, like a similar sample base some of the questions and there's really massive shifts. And so can you just explain the Connected Gen project and then uniquely what um, we're being able to offer in the Canadian space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> I'll back up and say that um, when I took on the leadership of the company in the in 2009, I uh, worked for George Barna, the founder of, of, the, of the Barna Group uh, for about 14, 15 years. And um, and then I took on the leadership and we did almost all the same kinds of things, social research. But one of the differences was I felt like we were being called into a more global expression that the problems mm. of American evangelicalism, and there are only like one or two of them. So, I mean, what could I be possibly be worried about? Uh, just joking. Uh, the problems of American evangelicalism, and they are, they are myriad, uh, is uh, that we, we could not solve them just by looking at ourselves and talking to ourselves mm. and hearing from ourselves. So... Um, that was one of the strategic decisions I made early on is that we would pursue, as, as the Lord allowed, a, a global international you know, opportunity, set of opportunities. Um, we'd also use more, more sort of design and infographic and some other sort of shifts in, in tone and emphasis. But, but among the, these would be you know, just re really fundamentally understanding what was happening in a broader, in a broader context. And, um, and so we were able to work um, starting in 2018. Um, We've done some other stuff in other places before that, but in 2018, uh, we were commissioned by uh, uh, um, World Vision to do a big global study of 25 countries, more than 15,000 interviews, all among millennials and sort of early, uh, sort of the, 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 the leading edge of Gen Z, Gen Z, um, so 18 to 35. And so, you know, this is an area that I've spent a lot of time interviewing again mostly in the states but a great pr privilege to be able to look at the spiritual profile of 18 to 35 35 year olds around the world and and so in canada we were able to also do so the original data collection was in 2019 we did a thousand interviews among 18 to 35 year olds in canada in 2019 and then we did another 1014 interviews in uh, 2021 and able to then look at you know what might have changed in in mm. reference to you know some of those things. So we can talk about some of those changes. But broadly speaking, this study looked at attitudes and uh, sort of sort of the mental health, sort of the anxious age. Uh, number one, number two, sort of connectedness with the church and sort of resilient discipleship a concept we we've been thinking about and writing about and studying, and then sort of uh, attitudes towards impact and causes and so social change. And so, um, you know, in the Canadian context, you know, you can find you can find more about the, the report at theconnectedgeneration.com or at barna.com slash Canada. Uh, you can find more about these reports. But, you know, some helpful tools, I think. And in some ways, we were already predicting, we didn't predict, predict a pandemic, but we sort of said, like, this generation is feeling the pressures of being at the whims of these global trends. The church mm. is both stronger in some ways then we might predict the generation is not as irreligious and secular as some people might predict or have, have guessed. But there's also these, these really um, important, you know, mental health challenges and challenges to the uh, credibility of the church that we were that we were looking at in 2019. And, and a lot of those things have just been, you know, as we as we've said, as Mark said, sort of accelerated since mm -hmm. the, the pandemic hit. Hmm. What do you think is most important? Like those themes are massive and I think we just need to, to start somewhere. I, I think I'm really like all of them are deeply interested, but I, I wanted to, um, to start with the, the question of the perception of the church because um, one of the things I noticed reading the report was how, neg how, how much the negative perception. So even one, one stat was saying the view that the church is detrimental to society. Between 2019 and then 2021, it like increased quite a bit, those that viewed that. And that it's that change that's quite interesting to me. I'm not surprised that there's a, a contingent that think that. 
Um, but I'm interested in that change. And so what else does the report showing in terms of views of the church that you think is important for church leaders in Canada to know about today? Yeah, so first of all, um, on that point, we, we saw the proportion of millennial Christians who feel that the Christian church is harmful or detrimental to society doubled between 2019 and 2021. And these are young people, 18 to 35, who are themselves practicing Christians and so their own perceptions of their own sort of their own, you know, faith tradition, the idea that it's harmful or detrimental doubled. 78% of all Canadian millennials believe that religion is becoming less important in society and in culture. So three out of four millennials across the board in uh, the Canadian context believe that it's becoming less important. And, and then another kind of interesting set of stats really related to, you know, kind of how COVID blew apart connectedness to local congregations. So a couple key stats, 41% of millennial churchgoers stopped attending the same church. 41% stopped attending the same church as before the pandemic. And 28% say they have stopped attending altogether. Um, mm. and, and that was like the first few weeks, Carrie Newhoff and I uh, do the podcast Church Pulse Weekly. And and right off the bat, we we said, you know, the problems we're, con- we're, we're fearful of are the habit forming nature of going a month, two months, three months, six months without the kind of usual rhythms. And um, we found that, you know, 22% of those Canadian millennials who had changed churches, um, we found that um, that they, they, they did so because they wanted more opportunities to serve in their community. So sometimes mm-hmm. it was that local churches weren't offering, you know, enough ways of staying connected into community. Uh, but but there were other reasons. One in five of those who stopped attending said that they were already considering, you know, stopping before the pandemic and just sort of pushed them a little further over that, that precipice. Um, so social research is interesting because, you know, every story is so unique, like every human being who ticks the box, right? So we interview 1,014 millennials across the board, 18 to 35, including a subset of Christians, including a subset of non, non-faith non individuals, including other faith. And I always think about the spiritual stories that lead people up to a moment where they tick a box on one of our surveys and um, and the notion that they're admitting, yeah, I, I'm not attending church now and I was sort of thinking about leaving or, yeah, I'm actually pretty engaged now. I mean, there's a small, small segment of Canadian millennials who've actually become more engaged in church. Hmm. Usually it's because the church was offering real and and uh, meaningful ways for them to sort of find community and and uh, participation in their you know sort of like I sort of stay they stayed alive in in reference to their faith and and just life in general through their connection with the church so each of these different you can almost like create this really interesting flow chart of you know this this segment of millennials in Canada did this and this segment of millennials in Canada did this and each of these stories, the challenge for us as leaders is not to let those anecdotes that we come across, like, oh, I know mm. this one millennial who did this or this one millennial who said this, become our um, our guide, but instead to use data like this. And as far as I know, this is now the most current data on kind of the mental and emotional health of Canadian millennials, the spiritual engagement of Canadian millennials, how they think about sort of life out in the world in terms of causes and concerns. And so we should use this as, you know, not the, we shouldn't be data driven, but we should be data informed. And mm-hmm. uh, I think this, this tells us that the pandemic is having these, it's, it's, it's having a, a, a very profound effect on the way millennial, millennial Christians and millennials in general in Canada view and engage with the church. And I think we have to take, take stock of that and figure out what, mm-hmm. what do we need to do next based on all that. Yeah. What do you think, Mark, when you hear that, um, and I know that some of that might be unique to Canada, but I know for you in Melbourne and while the stage of lockdown you're in is different, mm-hmm. I think a lot of sort of the cultural currents reflect something that you're probably experiencing day in day out. When you hear that data, what do you think stands out to you as a pastor and someone who's reflected mm-hmm. on this deeply? Um, I'm gonna, I think the first thing is that they've, I think, you know, there are differences between Canada and Australia, but if I had to look for countries, if I had to look for a country outside of New Zealand, who's probably the most similar to Australia, I mean, possibly Canada would be one of them with our shared sort of history um, or traditions. And, you know, I think about that my city has been in, or about to approach the world's longest lockdown. So part of me is like, you know, if we did do similar research, um, you know, what would be the effects here? But, you know, they actually very tailor to what I'm seeing here, what I'm seeing in particular the parts of Australia, which experience longer lockdowns. And, Um, I think that comment, I think Dave said, you know, in some sense, there were people already thinking about leaving. Um, So I'm not surprised. I think that part of one way we could misread this is this is people have left because of the pandemic. 
Mm -hmm. when really I think the pandemic exposed things that were already occurring. Um, there was already conversations that, you know, millennials were attending church less regularly, they were less committed. Um, their views were being increasingly more shaped by, you know, cultural factors rather than a biblical worldview. So it's not any surprise to me. Um, and in some ways, um, what we're seeing, you know, when we were able to come back for a short period before we went back into lockdown was exactly what you said. There was a moment in in the service the last week before we went back down into lockdown um, where I looked around the room and there was a lot of millennials in the room and I sensed the hunger in this group who'd stayed through this epic lockdown. And so that's partially where I'm not surprised because I think I've been following these trends. What I'm excited about is that cohort who have pushed in more. Mm. And I think that's a more authentic, you know, and a view of church. And, and I sort of have this sense that we're coming to the end of this period where you know, the church growth thing has told us to meet people's needs in order to get them to come to church. And in many ways, we're seeing the falling of that in many ways. Mm. You know, it's, it's more than just the uh, pandemic. So weirdly, I, I'm pretty sober about it, but I'm also encouraged that the church in Canada is going to have a refined remnant. Mm. And refined remnants are always the basis out of which renewals move and come. Mm. What does it look like to stoke the fire of a remnant? Like if the pastor's saying, what do I do right now? I think one instinct could be, I've got to go and try to grab hold of those. And I think there's actually something to be said about saying the door's open, come back, you know, like welcome, like mm. an, a big welcome to those who maybe feel disconnected. But for those that would reflect what you described as a remnant, what what is the pastor or the spiritual leader or the small group leader or whatever youth pastor listening, like do to stoke that remnant in this time? Yeah, I think that... <sighs> Terry Walling um, said that the problem is diagnosing what's happening is, you know, we were trying to get attenders when we needed to make apprentices. And I think that that remnant who are pushing in, there are people out there who genuinely want to go somewhere, be part of a church, be part of a ministry where the leaders are actually pushing into God and really want to go for it. Mm. <laughs> Not make it about the B and C things, make it about the A, the, the, the center of pursuing Jesus. So I think that, you know, any pastor, in some ways, this is a relief. I think this is what this is saying is, hey, you don't have to put on the massive show and run endless programs and just generate endless attendees and keep them happy all the time. Um, uh, really, I think this is an opportunity for church leaders to pursue God with all their heart. You know, personal renewal leads to corporate change. And I think some of the renewals that God has been doing in the hearts of leaders during the pandemic, where they realize they're not as in much control as they thought. We can't just rely mm. on a predictable program that runs into the future in the schedule. Um, that actually, I think that uh, that's the space in which people need to lead out of. And that's the authentic thing that millennials are looking for. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. You talk about this idea of, of uh, fa fanning the flames of, of renewal. And I mentioned just a few minutes ago that I spent about two two hours uh, last night <laughs> in, in yeah. insomnia. But the section I was in was um, in in Second Timothy verse one, and um, I'll just read a couple a couple of these things. But it's ver, ver, chapter one verse six. Um, well, it starts in, in chapter uh, verse five. He says, "I remember your genuine faith." This is Paul, of course, writing to Timothy. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And so there's this really interesting, like, remember your remember your family roots of people that are following the Lord. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. It's just like mm -hmm. so profound, right? And then this is, this is where your question really sparked for me was, he says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. And so I would I would just ask uh, Canadian church leaders and those listening to this podcast like when was the last time we laid hands on millennials and said we want to we want to call you know call the spiritual gifts call these gift the areas of giftedness in the workplace in your neighborhood uh, in your in your family among your friend groups among your influence group among your social media tribe we want to fan into flame uh, you know what God has deposited in you because we're mm -hmm. not going to see renewal as as sort of Mark said through a bunch of great strategy or even great social research. <laughs> Hard as it is for me to believe that social research won't be the, the catalyst for, you know, the sort of spiritual renewal. <laughs> but but this idea that Paul Paul is sort of saying, like, you know, re remember this moment when I, as an older leader, kind of commissioned you to think about what mm -hmm. God had deposited uniquely in you and fan into flames that gift. And then later uh, in that section of 
uh, verse 12, um, he basically says, he says, I know the one in whom I trust, and I'm, he's in prison during this letter, letter writing. He says, I know the one whom, whom I trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. And so for me last night, that was the, the verse that was referenced in this little book called Waiting, a terrific older book. Uh, where he's just, you know, helping you understand, like, what does it mean to be have the right posture before the Lord when we are in seasons of waiting? Hmm. And um, this idea that, you know, we can actually trust that what we have entrusted in our hearts as leaders, we're, we're in this work because God has called us, he's given us opportunities. And I know for me, this last 18 months, I've never had a greater period of soul searching in my entire life than what it means to lead during this time. Now, some mm-hmm. listeners will know I also lost my wife during, you know, uh, about a year ago. Um, it's been a soul-crushing period of time. Also, the Lord has been very close to me in ways that are pretty pretty profound. And mm-hmm. so I'm sitting at this moment where verses like that are just ministering deeply to me because I've, yeah. I've put my trust in the Lord that He can use me and if he doesn't need to use me, the great. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not fixated on what I can accomplish for God. I'm just enjoying his, his, his refreshing. But this notion that then, um, you know, we can actually trust that God, in the context of of Canada, in the U.S. and Australia and other in other places, that God's actually like wants to fan into flames the gifts He's given us. And so that would be my uh, both just reflection on this little devotional time, unexpected mm. devotional time I had last night, but also just speaking for the millennials we interviewed around the world, they do not want the church just to be a place where they can sit and passively consume the great mm. ideas that you that you exegete or the great stories you tell. They want to be fanned into flames. The gift, they, want to, they want to have their gifts fanned into flames. They want to be contributors to the movement of the Lord. They want they want to be active in the, in the world. And this is some of the things that I think is so so powerful about this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know maybe there's a strategy in this. Maybe there's not. Maybe it's just a, a response to the scriptures. Like like go lay hands on millennials in your church if you're older leaders or millennial Gen Z leaders. Go ask to be laid hands on and say, help me to fan into flames a faithful response to what God has entrusted to me in terms Mm. of these gifts. Mm. Anything to add to that, Mark? Oh, look, I I wholeheartedly agree. I I think that one of the elements of uh, this research, um, you know, I had the privilege of being able to travel uh, on the road with uh, Dave in Australia, and then I also was able to present in, in Malaysia. And I think this concept of resilient disciples, um, that effectively this research, which actually showed, like as a pastor, looking at across, across the congregation on a Sunday morning, I can't tell exactly where people are, you know, and, and, you know, I think there was a lot of presumptions that people went back, you know, 30 years. If you're in the room, they're a committed disciple. I began to realize, you know, a few years ago, if they're in the room, I don't know where they are spiritually, like they can be all over the place. And so, you know, what the research uh, shows us is, you know, who are the remnant of resilient disciples who, let's put it in this way, my translation, really believe this stuff and really want to live this stuff. (laughs) And, you know, I I remember, you know, being in Malaysia, uh, for me, first of all, seeing, and I think this is where it's going to be a real treat for the church in Canada, because often like Australians and Canadians, we, we want to know what is actually going on. We often have to sort of take stuff from the US and try and extrapolate it. We know it's a bit different. So I think it's going to be a real gift for the Church of Canada to see actually what it's actually going on. Um, but I remember being in Malaysia, the, the room was filled with people who were just so hungry to know what's the actual state of the church in Malaysia. And to see that actually Malaysia had one of the highest levels of resilient disciples in this global study. Mm. And I, I was looking around going, why is this? The church in Malaysia faces pressures that the church in Australia, Canada, and the US doesn't. It's a wow. Muslim majority country. Yeah. And there is pressure there, you know, and people talked about the fact that, you know, the, the church there lets you, perhaps if you're Chinese, convert someone who's Chinese, but you can't convert someone who's Islamic or Malay. And what I realized there is the increased pressure that we're feeling in, in places like Canada isn't bad news necessarily because the country like Malaysia, which has had far higher pressure, is actually producing better disciples. So that's why I think part of the fanning of flames that we need to do and laying hands on on millennials is they're going to have, a, I think, a more pressurized future. Mm-hmm. But the history of the church tells us that when the future is more pressurized, when it's more chaotic, when there's more disruption, the culture is more unfriendly to the church, that's the moment that great disciples are 
are born. And so I actually think that, you know, Dave's 100% spot on. That's a fantastic verse to go back to. There, are, I feel like there was almost like these, these forgotten, you know, grandfathers and grandmothers of the faith who prayed for people. You know, all of us on this call, I'm sure there are people who may have now passed generations ago who were praying for us, perhaps even mm-hmm. when we were babies, perhaps even before we were born. And, you know, th- that witness does not go, you know, unrecognized by God. So yeah. I'm really excited about the next generation. I think there's challenges for the church in Canada, you know, all these issues that the church in Canada is facing, you know, around Indigenous issues and all of this. It's easy to lose heart. Um, mm. However, when you look at how God works in history, these are the exact kind of moments where he does really, I think, spectacular things. Hmm. One of the things that's coming through my mind as you guys are sharing is like, I have a bad habit. I, I'm the only one on the call who's in the demographic of the research. So I'm just barely under that in the age group there that was being researched. And um, I think one of the things, so I can make fun of us, so I'm going to roast us a little bit, is we really think like, man, we have it the worst. Like people are like, this is the worst ever. This is the worst year in the history of the world. And it's just such, it's just so unrooted in reality. You know what I mean? Uh, I was down um, with some of our friends, uh, some pastors primarily from the States and John Tyson was like, to this talk and he was like, you know about the 60s? You guys know about the 60s? Let me tell you about the 60s, right? And I feel like you could pick almost any decade that our grandparents or whatever could say, do you know about the 60s? Do you know about the, <laughs> the first two decades of the 1900s? Like there's a lot to go back to. And I think there's like an, uh, a sense by which when I hear the research and I hear where we're in and I ask the question, what the heck's going on? That actually like, and I think it's really important to us, these are unique times. These are massive shifts. But there's also a sense of like maybe an arrogance or like, a, let me shift the word. Arrogance is maybe the wrong tone. Blinders that, that cause us to not see the faithfulness of God. That in every generation, he's raised up people. And he's been telling the story, like the church survived through the first and second century against the hand of Rome. Like, how is that possible, you know? And he's been so faithful. But then the interesting thing is, Instead of saying, what the heck, how is this thing going to make it? To say, oh, is it possible that we might be among those who God did raise up for this time uniquely? He's been faithful in every time before. I wonder if we're uniquely raised up for this time. What do you guys think? Uh, I I agree. I think think that... I think, first of all, your comments around, you know, part of my reading is people saying, oh, we're heading to this new horrifying moment, you know. And so when I talk about some of these trends, I think we're returning to normality. I think Mm -hmm. we're in some kind of myth world. And I think part of millennials and and some of the commentary around them, you know, often unfairly, is not so much about something innate to a millennials. They were raised at a particular time where the world went into this sort of, particularly in the West, went to this fantasy zone that we're just going to like, progress to some wonderful utopia, the economy's always going to grow, war's over, technology will solve everything. It was always a myth. Um, we're just returning to normality. And so, you know, I, I look at that world and I think, again, this is linking into some of the anxiety stuff, just to touch on that and how this links to this, is I think that that part, some of, in every culture, there are mental health um, cohorts of people who struggle with mental health. What's unique about this moment is the usual cohort that you might f- may find in a particular people in history, be it in Samoa or Japan, the mental health things exploded beyond the usual cohort of people who have mental health. So we have to then deduce that there is a structural, systemic, cultural issue to mental health. Hmm. And I think part of that is that we've been told that the world is this very safe place. The world is there to make you feel more comfortable uh, and so the danger of this moment is actually when the world gets more chaotic to retreat into a comfort zone. And I actually think that uh, we need to re- you know, re-grab onto what you're talking about. The fact that God always has the church who in every age he raises up a new cohort of people to actually act through. And that, you know, many of the millennials, and also just to add something too, millennials are moving into middle age. Hmm. Millennials are no longer the young one. You know, Dave there talked about the OK Boomer thing, which I'm aware of. I'm learning from my kids the whole OK Millennial thing. Where yeah, that's real. Gen- I'm feeling that. Oh, it's huge. The Gen Zs are totally, or Gen Z, Gen Z to translate, are totally defining themselves against um, uh, millennials. They're a world of you know Gen Z memes, you know, sort of mocking the millennials. Um, so there's an element now where the whole thing of millennials is the young ones. You're not the young ones anymore. Uh, actually, what you are is you're the next generation is going to step into the sort of, you know, leadership position. So how do you lead well? And how do you even lead those coming up behind you well? Hmm. Um, 
So I think, you know, this, this is what I say all the time. You know, people, God has created people for this exact moment. You know, there are people in Canada listening to this, perhaps in the churches of leaders, uh, people who are listening, perhaps in the back row or perhaps watching on a Zoom screen, uh, depends on what's going on, um, who actually God is preparing. You know, mm-hmm. David got prepared in the wilderness. David beats Goliath with what he learnt in the hidden places of how to fight a lion with the Lord's strength. And I think that actually in Canada, there's a whole bunch of Davids uh, who are currently being formed over the last sort of 10 years who will step into their mantle of leadership. Uh, but we, we need to understand that the preparatory work that God is doing when he prepares people for a particular moment. Hmm. Hmm. I got this phrase going on in my head. Um, and it actually hit me, David, when you were sharing about the external realities of the last two years, but then your very personal internal realities, Jill passing. And and I, I, the first thought was, I'm curious how this has changed your leadership. You're a gifted leader, um, but there's a different tone. Like you've been impacted by this. And then Mark, if you can pick up on that, you and I have had some conversations on this, you know, personally about what kind of leaders are made for this time. And it's a different mm-hmm. type of humble confidence. And so maybe you could start, David. I think I wanted to circle around this idea of like, how we view ourselves as Christian leaders, and maybe God is raising up a new kind of leader for this time. Uh, well, thanks for asking that. And um, I actually feel like I'm on something of a, a journey to answer, or at least to wait on the Lord for 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 thoughts about that, and 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 not just you know sort of easy maxims, but but just like the Lord's presence in my life. And I think. Um, there's there's so much to say about that. First, I don't I don't have easy answers to that. I do think it's a question all of us should be wrestling with. Whether you've lost something uh, as dear as I have, or as as we've all gone through uh, a year of, of incredible pressure, uh, both externally and for all of us on some level internally, with the mental health of just sort of like everything we thought we knew how to do, the road is moving from where we thought it was to a completely different place. Um, so I'm still on that journey. It's actually at the heart of what I'm sort of thinking about and just journaling a ton. Mm. Um, and um, that, you know, I was with a, a dear friend, a pastor who's sort of stepping back from ministry in the season on Saturday morning. And, and I was telling him that second Corinthians, I've been in second Corinthians uh, for about four months now. And he said, no way. So am I. And he, we've both been going through some, some, some challenges um, me losing my wife and him, some other things. And, and, and so he said, you know, second Corinthians, he summed it up as when, when you can't fix things, what you can do is try to find meaning in, in what the Lord is saying and doing. And, and so I do think we're at this Kairos moment, um, a verse, a life verse for me is Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. And you can almost imagine the prophet sort of saying, do you not perceive it? You know, instead of just shouting it out, it's like, could we, could, should we, could we slow our lives enough to to say do we perceive it um one of the gifts that i think the 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 passing of my dear jill uh has given me is the chance to really slow down um mm. and to see a little bit of the the end from the beginning like you know i too am going to take that journey um someday at the lord's choosing that she took and she took it with a lot of a grace and dignity and courage that you know she would have um you know life with jesus and and so it's 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 funny I've I've sort of told a few friends um, I haven't said this in any other like podcast so 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 here you go it's it's a little like Keanu Reeves at the end of the Matrix where like all of a sudden you realize you can dodge bullets and like everything else that seems so so uh, mortal uh, is mm-hmm. like it doesn't really matter you know and so I do think we're at this moment where we should be very cautious and careful with the things that we thought were uh, so important to taking over the world. You know, now this is partly a person in my mid forties who lost his wife, and so I'm sort of in that Zen place. Forgive the expression, but just this peaceful place of waiting on the Lord. But I think all of us should sort of recognize that you know the things we were doing to try to like increase our followers or the number of attenders. I mean, the the pandemic has revealed that those things didn't actually create the kinds of of resilient disciples that we thought that mm-hmm. they were doing. But the laying on of hands and praying for a young disciple to say, like, like fan into flames, that might have done it, right? The, 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 the trip down uh, the, the memory lane to sort of like acknowledge the gifts that our families and our heritage and our legacies have given us 
could do it. Um, this sort of like like reliance on the Lord that you know that he could in, that he could be trusted to keep the promises that we have made to him uh, to serve to serve him. Um, and and so I believe that God's in a period right now of creating a whole new set of of leaders, as as Mark just said, um, for a new moment who mm. are who are going to be driven by a very different set of things that you know like ministry that matters in this new era is 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 going to look a lot different. I think than sort of the um, uh, the the roll call Christianity where we try to get you know lots of people in lots of in lots of places. I mean, Alpha has been such a great. We've we've had a chance to be up close and and, and personal with a lot of Alpha's work at Barna, doing kind of assessment work and this idea of being hospitable and conversational mm-hmm. and opening a place for the Holy Spirit to work and this message of this transformational message of Jesus. Um, you know, Alpha, like any ministry, has its things that it needs to continue to to, to refresh and think about where the Spirit is leading it. Uh, but but I, I think there's so many good things that are happening in the church today. We should we should acknowledge and do more of it. But the kinds of leaders that are going to be required are at least those that are sort of finding their um, finding their uh, their deepest you know the, their deepest love and their truest center at what scriptures tell us about about ourselves. I feel like what I'm hearing is like. And I think this might be part of the kind of leader that God is raising up in our time, like appropriately more skeptical of what we can do on our own strength. Like kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't know about all this stuff we've been doing, but then at the very same time, like way more confident in what God is doing and capable of doing. Absolutely. Like it's like this, like it, it means we don't have to go and hype the room because they're like, you know, that, that was the leader that I thought I needed to become was the one that could like come and woo the room and sell the stuff I was doing. And I just feel like even just listening to you right now, I'm really impacted, David, by like this humility. It's like, man, I, social research isn't going to change at all, but it could help and all this stuff. But then a, <laughs> like a quiet confidence that the Lord's doing it. We're part of it. He's building it. What do you think, Sayers? I, I'd love to just mark something that you marked, which I think could be one of the most important things in this entire conversation for people listening. And, and you just mentioned how there's something that you sense that God has done with Dave. And I think what that thing is, is spiritual authority. And we as a church has been so focused on ability and we've forgotten about spiritual authority. Um, it's it's not something that you can programatize to get spiritual authority. It's something that the Holy Spirit does. And it comes from this faithfulness of continuing to walk with God in difficult seasons. Uh, there's this really weird trip, which I, the last time we were together, I think it was 2019 uh, in, in Vancouver. And for me, that was just such a fascinating trip because, um, you know, I just had released this book. There was this whole sort of hunger in the world for this sort of new renewal and I was actually, you know, mentioned John Tyson before. I was in New York speaking at John's church, and I was on top of his building, praying uh, after preaching. And I just felt like the complete opposite thing. I felt the Holy Spirit was showing me to what I felt. So my my human thing was like, wow, this 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 rocket is taking off. This is the next thing, you know, like like finally things are coming into alignment. There's going to be this renewal. How do we sort of run this thing? And I just felt like the Holy Spirit saying something was coming. Now, I'm not saying I predicted the pandemic, but there was a shift and I was trying to work this out. And I caught up with uh, Dave at the end of that. So, you know, flew across the the, the huge continent of, of North America and um, we caught up and there was just this moment where we were praying and uh, on this pier, <laughs> almost like a Baywatch scene in California, there's the American flag <laughs> flapping in the bright sun. And, and I just felt like what the Holy Spirit was saying to me at that moment was this phase shift was coming. There was this phase shift that the church was going to hit difficult times, the culture was going to hit difficult times, but not to be afraid because God is raising up a new kind of leader. In that moment, I could recognize what God was doing with Dave. Dave is, is someone who has tremendous intellect and ability and has built this company and you know, give, you know given so many gifts to the church. And um, But I realized that actually while I was sitting there, I don't know if I've ever expressed this to Dave in in these terms, but I could recognize that the Holy Spirit was doing something in him, building spiritual authority and being friends with Dave. I've only seen that grow in the last season. And I believe that in the next, you know, there's a lot of talk now about cryptocurrencies and what's the next currency of the world. I believe that the next currency of this networked, digital, disrupted age that we're going into is actually spiritual authority. 
It is the breakthrough disruptive currency that disrupts the powers and principalities of the world. And everything that's happening at the moment, you know, the United States is having this moment in the kind of leadership model that it's put out into the world. There's the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast, all of this stuff that's going on. And, and I just want to mark something, particularly for the church in Canada. Um, Canada necessarily doesn't have that sort of personality in the same way. And the Christian church in Canada, despite being close to that, does not have the same thing. And actually, there's a quietness, there's a humbleness. But what can sometimes be missing is that that's going to be beneficial going forward. There's an authenticity, a humbleness, and a quiet quietness. But I think the thing that needs to be brought alongside that is spiritual authority. Hmm. And I actually think in the humbleness of Canada, that actually God's been doing something, preparing actually the church in Canada. And the new moment that we're moving into, I actually think God has a really key place for the church of Canada, not just in Canada, but the world. And so I believe that in a sense that this period of perhaps years have been preparation for the church in Canada. Uh, but now what the God is asking for the church in Canada is that this new generation of resilient disciples that are being built um, is actually wanting to put uh, this sense of spiritual authority upon them. So how do you, as a pastor listening to this, build a spiritual culture at your church, which actually drives people towards not just being an attender, but actually being someone at the end of this process of discipleship of spiritual authority. Uh, and that can only come when it's flowing out of your life as the leader. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot in you, there. You, you don't need to stop. Like I'm, I'm leaning in if you got more. I, I just feel something, and, and I guess I'm just, just sharing prophetically as well. Um, yeah, Canada is in this this conversation as well. Like part of that is suffering leads to spiritual authority when you keep walking forward with faithfulness. Hmm. So suffering leads to spiritual authority when suffering meets faithfulness and walking with Jesus through suffering. You know, I, I think another aspect of what it takes to lead in this moment <clears throat> is those that are not trying to outrun the, the things that they've suffered. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when I first started working on this book called Faith for Exiles, you know, I've been thinking about the idea of digital Babylon for 10 years about that, you know, we needed to understand the digital pressure and the sort of like, you know, Babylon in scripture is this sort of like, it's set up as the people of God, the systems and structures of God, you know, from Tower of Babel all the way to the great judgment in Revelation, and then Daniel, the sort of the actual political power of, of Babylon. Um, and, and so Babylon represents for Daniel and these exiles, uh, a skepticism of authority, uh, alienation from a way of Hebrew life that would have given them a, a cultural and spiritual center. Um, and a sense of, of, um, of, of access to new, you know, new powers and new, new opportunities that would have been, you know, un unknowable in, mm. in sort of the, in the Jewish, you know, sort of camps. So access, alienation and authority sort of define that. that those are three things that I think sort mm. of define our, our digital Babylon moment. So, so the, the way I think about people who have spiritual authority are, are exiles. Um, they're mm. people who've, who've lost something, who've lost a way forward. I think people, um, who are living in singleness today, um, who mm. want to be married, who have unwanted, unwanted singleness, have, uh, authority that they, and power because they're, you know, they're living in, in was sort of when they're living in holiness and sexual, um, celibacy, but in, in intimacy with other people, um, you know, relationally, um, for those that are experiencing same-sex attraction and who are who are choosing celibacy, I think there's a real sort of spiritual authority that comes with with those individuals. Mm. I think those who have suffered greatly. I mean, Paul writes about this a lot through, through Second Corinthians. That you know, it's like the death of Jesus lives in our bodies, and because of suffering, we learn, you know, that God is the source of all comfort. And then instead of trusting ourselves, we can just trust the Lord, right? So, so I think there's something about, you know what we need to be teaching and, and, and shining a light on is that so much of North American Christianity is focused on how, how are you successful and how can we amplify your gifts with the mm. loudest possible microphone. But I think we need to be able to amplify suffering. We need to amplify the stories of faithfulness through suffering because that actually gives a, a completely different hearing for the, the credibility of the gospel story and, mm. and all sorts of ways in which feeling that exile, being homeless, feeling as though, you know, you're, 
your rootedness, you can't find rootedness. Uh, those are places where, uh, where God, you know, brings, I think, great, uh, great opportunities uh, to, to those that are faithful. I did a graduation speech for my, for my alma mater um, a year after Jill got sick and about three years before she died. And I said, you know, you've been prepared for success, but have you been prepared for suffering? You know, wow. and so as Christian students, you know, we we should we should have done a better job. But here it's your, your last day, your graduation day. Let me at least tell you some perspective I learned in the last year, as my wife was battling brain cancer, and it turns out all the things we thought we were prepared for might not have been the most important lessons we learned. And so I think mm-hmm. um, it's true that we've all suffered th- things that that are, and and I think this is where millennials, Gen Z, are are actually quite uh, emotionally adept. They actually have mm-hmm. language for suffering. They have language for mental health challenges. They, um, you know, at the wrong side of this, they, they talk about their victimhood. They rec- they, what we all do, mm-hmm. we, we, we get, we, we feel like martyrs, but at the right side of it, we sort of, we, we're able to lean into the Lord's presence in times of, of suffering in ways that actually prepare us deeply for what he wants to do through us and in us. Um, guys, we've been talking about this a little bit already, this idea of like a new kind of leader, and we've been talking about data and we've been talking about shifts and trends. And I kind of want to just, I want to ask the question to you guys, maybe as we end here, um, what of this stuff matters most to the pastor listening? Like if you really guess like, there's a temptation to just, you know, we're going to do more conversations about connected gen and, you know, there's new research that um, we have in Canada about the state of evangelism. And the point of talking about shifts in culture, the point of talking about research has to actually hit the ground and, and, and impact something. So I think I'd love just to ask you guys as we, as we end, what do you think from this then is most at stake for us? Like, what do we, what do we need to walk away with that actually change the way we lead today? Well, I'll start and then Mark, you can give us a, a, cl- a closing thought. But um, I mentioned earlier this idea that I think about the, the moments that lead to someone taking 15 minutes to do an online survey, or in some cases, a phone survey. This, in these cases, for Connected Gen Canada, it was an online survey and ticking the box. Uh, we, we actually have no visibility on people that aren't literate, that aren't interested in spending time this way, that don't have sort of the discretionary or interest in doing this. So we're actually we're actually talking to the most connected of the connected gen. There's actually a whole group of people that are disconnected, that are disenfranchised, mm-hmm. that are that are that are stuck, that are you know struggling with some of the most um, elemental needs. And so I think um, f- first it's to to recognize that each of these stories matter, the millennials and young people. And if you are a young person, you know like like your story really matters um, to the future of the church. Um, Canada is not as Christianized as the U.S., uh, but it's not as secularized as uh, as the U.K. and and as Australia. Um, and so there are actually and there are pockets of of opportunity all over. And in no matter how secular, no matter how religious, there's pockets of opportunity. So really lean into these opportunities hmm. to you know be really honest about how the pandemic has shaped you know this moment and and. You know, we we said this at the very early stages of Connected Gen that the church has to be emotionally connected to the needs of young young people, teenagers, young adults, young leaders. Um, this is a moment where we can't um, s- s- sort of you, you know s- sort of PR or spin our way to a better future. We have to actually lead in in fresh and new ways, relying on the Holy Spirit to do that. So I think there's mm. just so many to to leave you with a, some hope. It's like there's so many opportunities. Um, in this moment, the the light has not gone out on faith in in uh, in and among young people in Canada. Quite the opposite. But there are challenges, and we have to be honest and reckon reckon with those as we see them. Oh, thank you. One thing I've been saying is there was a virus before the virus, and you know, in many ways, the church in the secular West was a lot like a frog in a kettle, and we were dying a death by a thousand cuts, and it was just happening really slowly. And people were becoming less committed and we were losing a generation slowly as they sort of slowly drifted out the door. And so in the midst of the crisis, I see this incredible opportunity. And I feel like uh, when things fully begin to emerge, that there's a sense and an invitation to be a very different kind of leader. And so I feel like there's this, you know, complete permission to actually step into the stuff. Like I, I just have this sense that there are many leaders listening at the moment who at one point, maybe it was before you went to seminary, maybe it was down the front of an altar call, maybe it was in a quiet place in the woods where God called you into ministry. 
and, and perhaps what the last two years, five years, 20 years has felt like is that original core thing that you felt God calling you to do, to love people, to save the lost, to, um, uh, you know, build up disciples, to serve the poor, that that's just been drifting and you feel like you're doing everything else but sometimes. And I feel like we're exiting into this moment where it's actually now this invitation to do the stuff of really mm. following Jesus. Like, like you have full permission now to really follow Jesus and to be just really clear here. Um, if we don't just really follow Jesus, we're in huge trouble. And so I feel like as we emerge, please take that permission. As, also where we are now, is we're now in a situation where we're moving culturally where people are going to be upset no matter what you do. Hmm. And, um, you know, so, you know, I think there is full permission to fully step into the Jesus stuff and to recognize the Jesus stuff that's been happening in you in the midst of this time. And, and I just feel like there's this individual thing that God's doing in leaders in Canada. And, you know, my real sense, I've been praying a lot. I really felt God when I came to Canada at last, or work of last travel in 2019. I just felt there's a sense that God has a special purpose for Canada. It's a really fascinatingly positioned strategically uh, in the next phase of what God's doing in the world. There's talk of hard power, where there's countries with big armies and big infrastructures, and there's soft power. And soft power is this thing where people are drawn to you because of your culture, and there's things which are, in a sense, less tangible. And I feel like God is positioning Canada for a next season because Canada actually has a lot of soft mm. power. And I see this incredible laboratory of what the church in the West can look like that has been given to people in Canada. You've got this Pacific reality, you know, with British Columbia. Then you've got this Atlantic reality in Toronto. So many different shades from prairies and and people in French speak. I mean, amazing, like post-Catholic French-speaking contexts are some of the biggest, toughest terrains uh, mm. for the secular sort of, you know, challenge of mission. But for those of you listening in those places, what an incredible opportunity to be part of the next thing that God wants to do and surprise people in the most secular of soil. You know, what actually if this the whole Francophone world, actually what if something new started in the Francophone world that actually began in the French-speaking peoples of Canada? Um, mm. You know, what if actually that sort of like Pacific Northwest secularized reality that people are talking about in places like, you know, Seattle and Portland. But what actually if Scott was doing something in Vancouver, uh, you know, it's actually flowing out. And watch actually now if Canada is moving from a, a sort of second place in the world where it looks what's happening in other countries and perhaps looks to what's happening south of the border and back to, you know, the motherland in the UK. Uh, but what actually if God is actually positioning the Canada to do something? I, I'm saying what if? I want to be honest, as an honest Australian, I actually believe he's going to do something through Canada. Um, so you're part of a, a local thing, but you're part of a bigger thing God's doing in the world. And we're being set up to be the solution for the next thing that God wants to do in the world, this renewal that I believe he wants to bring. So I actually think, despite all the bad news, be really encouraged. These are the moments when God does incredible things, and you're part of that. One really quick final thing. We're moving from the phase of the star leader, who's the superstar we're moving to now God creating a galaxy of leaders moving in symphony together, many stars as a whole, where you don't look at the star, you look at the creator behind the star. And I see across Canada that actually God is creating a galaxy, not superstars, but a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And that's the new mode of leadership that God's doing in the world for the next time. There it is. Uh, Mark, David, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Our pleasure. Well, I want to say thank you again to both David and Mark for making time to sit down with us today. And before you go, in just a moment, I want to share with you a clip from the conversation that we pulled out. And you'll understand why when you hear it. It was such a profound moment that we felt like we needed to put it in a standalone format. And it was actually a prophetic word that Mark shared that was on his heart towards the end of our conversation. He shared it. And it was so profound and powerful. And as a team, we've been praying and just thinking, okay, how do we best share this? And so we want to include it in today's episode, uh, but we wanted to make it something we end with. And so you'll get to hear that in just a moment. And as I mentioned on the top of the episode, today's conversation is part of a series of interviews on the Connected Generation Report. 
And to access and download the full Connected Generation Report, you can hit the link in the show notes. And next week, join us again for our second interview in this series where I sit down with Danielle Strickland. And we just can't wait for you to hear that conversation and all the other conversations that are part of this project. And grateful for Barna and World Vision Canada for investing in this research and sharing it with us today. Okay, so in the conversation, Mark Sayer shared a word. And I remember when he was on the podcast, must have been over a year ago, he had a word for Canada and it was super profound. And he shared something similar, but then he continued on and spoke prophetically, not just to church leaders in Canada, but specifically to Indigenous and First Nations leaders. And it was really encouraging and profound. And so like any sort of prophetic word, we submit it to you. And I think the best thing we do with something like this is pray, prayerfully discern it. And uh, it's deeply encouraging. And I find my heart saying, yeah, do it, Lord, raise up leaders like that in our time for the healing of our nation. And so let me, without any more commentary, throw it over to that word and we'll end with that. Yeah, and I just feel that there's something quite unique about our two countries. I think some of the the conversation that's happening in Canada at the moment, particularly around First Nations people, that I I think that also, which is also happening in my nation as well, that I actually think that there's a, a unique stewarding of something that God has, particularly upon Indigenous leaders in the Church of Canada who have known suffering in a way that many other Canadians haven't. But also, you know, and, and there's also things that needs to be, be done as the culture works through that and deals with everything that's happened historically. But I also think there's a spiritual authority, uh, particularly, I don't know who's listening to this or whatever, particularly any First Nations leaders. I think there's also a spiritual authority that God has granted Indigenous leaders in Canada which actually is going to actually mean that in the next season that they actually lead in a different way, not because, hey, there's the biggest churches or the best ability, but there's something unique that's actually being carried. And all of the turmoil and everything that's happening and all the hurt that's happening at the moment, uh, I actually believe that where we're heading into the next, into the next season, both, in both our countries, the spiritual destiny of our countries is actually linked to the, the Indigenous people and particularly Indigenous church being allowed to step into that authority to place that they have and particularly recognizing the spiritual authority that they have. And I have this real sense that, yes, there's going to be this generation of a resilient remnant of disciples that are raised up in Canada in the millennial generation. But I have this real sense prophetically that there's also within that a subset of First Nations millennial leaders who are going to step into a new spiritual authority that they have, which actually is going to lead the whole nation to a new place with God and the church to a new place with God. Just really sense that prophetically as we're speaking here.